Have you ever asked anyone to kill Michael for you? No. Okay. You sure about that? Yes. Okay. That's just absurd. Well, again, it's just oh, a question for you. On the night of March the 12th of 2016, a fight broke out at the West Meadows home of Michael Copper Siena in Melbourne's northern suburbs. The 32-year-old answered his front door and was met by Glenn Cassidy, a man recently wed to Bianca Edmonds, Copper Siena's former romantic partner and the mother of his child. Cassidy feared that his love rival would fight for custody of the child and had gone to his house that evening purportedly to hash out their differences. Capo Siena eventually unlocked the door when Cassidy asked to shake his hand. Upon entering the house, however, Cassidy pointed a sawn-off 22 caliber rifle at the homeowner's head. Armed with a kitchen knife, Capo Siena proceeded to defend himself by stabbing his visitor at least twice, to which Cassidy responded by firing his weapon. The men's resulting stab and gunshot wounds would ultimately prove fatal for both of them. Several hours before Cassidy killed the man he perceived as a threat to his fatherhood, a message had been sent from his phone to his wife. In it, the man appeared to absolve Edmonds of any responsibility for the violent crime he was planning, writing, If I get caught, I want them to know you had nothing at all to do with this. The text message, which seemed on the surface to be a cut-and-dry exoneration of the woman, immediately raised suspicions among those who knew Cassidy because of the absence of any spelling errors. The man was known to possess very poor literacy skills and even had other materials related to the crime on his phone, including a hand-drawn map of Capo Siena's property that were riddled with mistakes. Investigators subsequently drew the conclusion that the text Cassidy had supposedly sent to Edmonds had actually been written by the woman herself in an attempt to craft a seemingly airtight alibi. As the investigation progressed, it emerged that Edmonds often spoke of wanting her ex-boyfriend killed. A friend of the couple reported hearing the woman challenge her new husband to do it, allegedly promising him intimate favors in return for his completion of the murderous deed. For masterminding the nefarious plot, which inadvertently got her husband killed in addition to her intended target, Edmonds was arrested on murder charges. Her first trial, in June of 2022, ended in a hung jury. The subsequent retrial was dismissed following an issue with closing arguments. Then, in December, Edmonds' third trial at the Supreme Court of Victoria culminated in her conviction. Number 5. Shari Miller and Jerry Cassidy On November the 8th of 1999, Michigan man Bruce Miller was found dead at his junkyard in Mount Morris, having been gunned down with a 20-gauge shotgun. The shooting, it later emerged, had been committed by a former homicide detective named Jerry Cassidy. At the time, the latter had been working at a casino in Reno, Nevada and was saddled with problems related to finances, as well as his impending divorce. His search for solace eventually landed him in an AOL chat room with Bruce Miller's wife, Shari. Throughout the Miller's marriage, Shari had flirted with numerous men online, but in a development that differed from her prior flings, her relationship with Cassidy ultimately turned physical. The pair met up in person on several occasions leading up to Bruce's murder, which Cassidy was compelled to commit. After being inundated with Shari's fabricated stories about her husband, the woman reportedly told her lover that Bruce had ties to the Mafia. She also lied about being pregnant with Cassidy's child, only to tell him that Bruce had struck her in the stomach, causing her to lose the baby. The manipulative lies allegedly clouded Cassidy's judgment to the point where he was willing to avenge Shari by eliminating her husband from the picture. However, after the murder, a now widowed Shari began spurning Cassidy to pursue other dating relationships. On February the 11th of 2000, before the authorities caught on to the lover's murder plot, Cassidy took his own life, having grown despondent over his decaying relationship with Shari, as well as the lies she'd fed him about Bruce's alleged behavior. The man left behind a briefcase filled with letters and documents that implicated Shari in her husband's killing. There was enough evidence to arrest her on charges of second-degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder. 
Following her subsequent conviction and life imprisonment, the woman sought to be retried before ultimately admitting her guilt in a 2016 letter penned to Janice County Circuit Court Judge Judith Fullerton. Number 4. Pamela Smart and Billy Flynn After attending a work meeting on May 1st of 1990, Pamela Smart returned to her condo in Derry, New Hampshire, to find that the place had been ransacked. Her husband, Gregory, had been fatally shot during what police officials initially viewed as a burglary gone bad. As the authorities conducted their investigation, it began to emerge that the violent homicide, which left Pamela widowed at the age of 22, had been far more calculated and sinister than the haphazard crime scenes seemed to suggest. After Gregory and Pamela had only been married for a few months, the latter took a job as a media coordinator at Winnacunnet High School in Hampton. While volunteering for a school drug awareness program, she encountered a sophomore student by the name of Billy Flynn, with whom she subsequently sparked up an intimate relationship. Pamela's infidelity, coupled with the marital problems she and Gregory had already been experiencing, led to an irrevocable breakdown of their relationship. The young woman sought to have her husband killed and called upon her teenage lover to do it for her, threatening to withhold intercourse if he refused. Flynn enlisted the aid of three accomplices, later identified as Patrick Randall, Vansler Timmy Jr. and Raymond Fowler. To conclusively tie Pamela to the crime as well, law enforcement wiretapped conversations between her and her friend Cecilia Pierce. Their recorded interactions ultimately gave the police enough to arrest Pamela three months to the day from when the murder was committed. In a highly publicized trial, that marked the first time in US history that TV cameras were allowed in the courtroom. Prosecutors relied heavily on the testimony of Pamela's teenage co-conspirators, who'd already agreed to plea deals at that point. The two-week trial ended on March the 22nd of 1991, when the woman was convicted of being an accomplice to first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and witness tampering. She was given a life sentence with no chance of early release. Flynn Randall, Latimi and Fowler were each given lengthy prison sentences as well, but have since been released on parole. Number 3. Christy Evans and Khalil Square To the outside world, Oklahoma pastor David Evans and his wife of 30 years, Christy, were respected members of the Ada community, well-liked by the congregation at Harmony Free Will Baptist Church. Behind the facade of piety and a happy marriage, however, there long existed a dark side to the Evans' relationship. The wicked secrets that marred their ostensibly blissful lives finally caused tensions between them to reach a boiling point on March the 22nd of 2021. As David slept in his bed that night, an armed intruder crept into the Evans' residence and fatally shot him. The gunman was identified by police as 26-year-old Khalil Square a Moore resident with whom Christie had previously had an affair. Square was swiftly arrested and charged with first-degree murder. Suspicions immediately fell upon the now-widowed woman as well, given her close connection to the shooter. Investigators were ultimately able to ascertain that Christie had begged Square to commit her husband's murder, which she helped plan. The woman allegedly provided her lover with the murder weapon, as well as ammunition, and even gave him access to their home so that he could carry out the shooting while David was asleep. To many in the couple's social circle, the entire ordeal was nothing short of shocking. However, to Christie's relatives and those who knew the true nature of her relationship to David, the latter's murder was tragic but unsurprising. As Christie would go on to tell investigators following her arrest, her husband had been abusive and coercive throughout their decades-long marriage. She described him as being not only physically abusive towards her, but also financially controlling, further accusing him of forcing her to have intimate relations with 50 to 100 other men, including Square. In court, prosecutors conceded Christie's portrayal of her slain husband, whom they labeled a dark, dark individual. They argued, however, that David's secrets didn't absolve the woman of legal culpability for the crime which she'd allegedly orchestrated, at least in part, in pursuit of the man's $250,000 life insurance policy. Christie was described as a very good liar who took advantage of a man in Square who was just gullible enough to fall into her web of deception 
and manipulation. In the summer of 2022, Christie was sentenced to life in prison for facilitating her husband's murder. A few months later, Square was likewise given a life sentence after entering a guilty plea to his murder charge. Number 2. Patty Presba and Jaime Ramos California fire investigator Tom Oldag was called to the scene of a blaze in a ravine along a winding back road in El Dorado County on June the 25th of 2008. While reviewing the area, Oldag spotted a crashed vehicle through the smoke, later recounting it looked like a ghost ship. Upon approaching the car, the man noticed an exceedingly foul odor, which he immediately recognized as burning flesh. The previous day, a missing persons report had been filed for Garden Valley man Ron Presper, who hadn't returned home after going out to buy propane. Authorities quickly confirmed that the wrecked SUV at the scene of the fire belonged to Presper and his wife, Patty, who worked for the California Conservation Corps. While investigating the crash site further, detectives found blood on the road as well as in a plastic bag recovered from the ravine. When the DNA was tested, it was conclusively matched to Ron Presper, leading investigators to theorize that the car crash hadn't been an accident at all, but rather a calculated attempt to cover up a homicide, as was the fire itself. While questioning Patty at the couple's home, officers discovered suspicious blood spatter, which they believed to be the site of the murder. The woman gave police the name of a young man who'd recently been living with them, 21-year-old Jaime Ramos. He'd abruptly moved to Texas on the same day as the fire, and investigators subsequently gathered that he'd been having an affair with Patty. Before the latter could be confronted with law enforcement's discovery, she went missing. Then on July the 25th, authorities tracked Ramos's car down to a motel parking lot in Salt Lake City, Utah. Both he and Patty were inside the vehicle, suffering from non-life-threatening gunshot wounds. Patty later indicated that her lover had taken her hostage and that she'd shot him in self-defense. But Ramos refuted her claims. He revealed that everything from Ron's murder to the fire to the staged hostage situation had been devised by Patty, who manipulated him into complicity by lying about being abused by her husband. Both Ramos and Patty eventually pleaded guilty to murder charges and were sentenced to 25 and 42 years in prison, respectively. Number 1. Robin Lindholm, Wayne Amy and Torsten Trabert Australian couple Robin Lindholm and George Templeton had been married for about seven years and were living together in Reservoir when the latter suddenly went missing in May of 2005. On the night he was last seen alive, Templeton had been commemorating his late father with a glass of the Greek brandy known as Metaxa, which he'd asked his wife to purchase for him. Lindholm and her friend Matilda Burke eventually went out, but upon returning home, Templeton was gone. Two men, one of whom was identified as Wayne Amy, had reportedly broken into the couple's house and killed Templeton, although it was never conclusively determined whether the murder occurred inside the home or at a different location. Amy, it would later emerge, had been having an affair with Lindholm, whom prosecutors later accused of lacing her husband's dinner with sleeping pills to make him easier to deal with for her lover and his accomplice. None of this was discovered in the immediate aftermath of Templeton's death, however, so with her husband now eliminated from the picture, Lindholm moved in with Amy in Hawthorne. In 2013, the woman began dating a man by the name of Torsten Trabert, leading to an irretrievable breakdown in her relationship with Amy. The former couple got into a property dispute which they were scheduled to appear in court to discuss one day in December of 2013. Amy, however, never showed up. The police ultimately uncovered that Amy had been accosted in his apartment block's parking lot by two men, one of whom was identified as Lindholm's new paramour, Traybert. The assailants reportedly struck the man over the head with a baseball bat before stuffing him in the trunk of a car. They then drove to a remote location, killed Amy and tossed his body in the bush. The police were able to tie Lindholm to Amy's killing and while investigating the matter renewed the investigation into Templeton's 2005 disappearance. Lindholm ultimately faced murder charges for arranging both of her partner's deaths, for which she was jailed for a minimum term of 25 years. Thanks for watching. Would you rather 
date someone who is able to manipulate you into doing anything for them or suffer from random bouts of Tourette's? Let us know in the comments section below.